Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu alayka ya sabbat al-anbiya ibn al-Muslim. Amma ba'd, fa'awzu billahi min al-shaytan al-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala fi al-Qur'an al-Kareem. Alif lam min thalika al-kitabu la rayba fi hudan lil-muttaqin. صدق الله العظيم وبلغنا رسوله النبي الكريم سبحان الله وقد صدقت انت يا سيدي يا سيدي يا سيدي يا سيدي يا مكي يا مدني يا عربي يا قرشي يا هاشمي ويا سيدنا يا سيدنا يا سيدنا يا حبيبنا يا طبيبنا يا حبيب المصطفى المجتبى صلى الله عليه واله وسلم سبحان الله First of all, I would like to express my gratitude to all the organizers of this beautiful event and especially Janabe Ridwan Sahib, the chairman of PMT and the Sadr Sahib, the president Sahib and all the ulama and the dignitaries who have blessed us with their presence tonight Hazrat Allama Qari Sahib, Imam Sa'iji Sahib, Hafizullah Ta'ala and Hazrat Alama Musa Sahib, Musa Rida Sahib and all the Muslims, the Shayyum, the scholars from, from Turkey and all the Mashayikh, MashaAllah the Tullab Al-Ilm, the students of sacred knowledge and the Ulama, the Mudarrisun and all brothers and sisters who are present in this beautiful gathering Jazakumullah Khaira wa Ahsan Jaza for inviting me and for blessing me with this opportunity so that I can convey the message of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the teachings of the awliya Allah and my gratefulness is imparted to all the brothers who have been in contact with the members of Kanzul Huda uh, in UK for organizing this event and all the helpers of brother Ridwan their families who have come from distant places only to attend this gathering the verse of the Quran that I have recited in this Quranic verse, Allah Jalla wa Ala says, La rayba fihi, there is no doubt in it. La rayba fihi, hudan lil muttaqeen. In a state that the Quran is a guidance for the muttaqeen. And according to Imam al Nasafi rahimahullah, in this Quranic verse, the word muttaqeen is referring to awliya Allah the people of Allah Jalla Ma'ala. Now the reason why I recited this Quranic verse, commonly people say that Allah Jalla Ma'ala says in the Quran, there is no doubt in the Quran. But well, why is it that we all recite the Quran? People who follow different groups within Islam, they all claim to be followers of the Quran and followers of the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa alayhi wa sallam. When Allah Jalla says in the Quran, La Raybu fi, there is no raib in the Quran, there is no shak in the Quran, there is no doubt in the Quran. Then why is it that many of us we follow the same Quran, but the belief that we have is completely opposite than the belief of the others? That is one question that I will be answering. And the other point which Habib Ridwan emphasized the importance of that, one part of that was covered in the Jum'ah talk today. And that was based on the Quranic verse in the Salat that Allah Jalla Ta'ala says in the Quran that the prayer stops you from sinful acts. But why is it that my prayer doesn't stop me from sinful acts? Anything that displeases Allah Jalla Ta'ala, the prayer will prevent you from doing that. But people have been offering their prayer, establishing their prayer according to some people for such, for such a long time. But why is it that they cannot refrain from sinful acts? So I mentioned in the Jum'ah talk the difference between offering the prayer and establishing the prayer and I gave six points if we act upon them then we will attain concentration in our salah and there will come a time that you will fall in love with the prayer so this was a practical method of attaining complete concentration in salah if you act upon those six points inshallah you will be blessed with complete concentration in salah you will fall in love with the prayer and there will come a time inshallah in your life when you will feel hungry and thirsty for the prayer you will not be able to sleep without salah. So we mentioned the importance of those points 
One thing that I mentioned, that if you act upon the ahkam of Sharia, the six points that have been presented in the talk, then inshallah ta'ala, the prayer itself will stop you from committing sins. A lot of people say, we make tawbah, then we break tawbah, then we make tawbah, then we break tawbah, and then there comes a time in your life when a person begins to think that tawbah is just, it's a joke. There's no need of making tawbah. Since I can't maintain my tawbah, so what is the point of making tawbah when I can't maintain tawbah? So in my Jummah talk, I mentioned that this gathering, inshallah, in this talk, I will begin with some practical methods of making tawbah, that if you act upon them, inshallah, Allah will bless you with istiqamah in tawbah. One is attaining concentration in salah, establishing the prayer with complete khushu and khudu, in that I mentioned the six points, if you act upon them, inshallah, you will attain complete khushu and khudu in salah, there will come a time in your life as if you are having a secret conversation with your Lord. As if you're talking to Allah Jalla wa'ala. And when you gain the nur of salah, then the salah itself will stop you from sinful acts. So that's one thing we have to do. And the second thing to maintain our tawbah, to, to attain steadfastness in our tawbah, we have to learn the basic trick of tawbah. We have to learn the practical method of tawbah. How to make tawbah. A lot of young people, they think just saying the word Astaghfirullah is sufficient to make tawbah. People will be backbiting and they will say, um, I'm not trying to backbite. I'll do tawbah from backbiting. Astaghfirullah, but so and so is a bad person. So they think we can backbite and then we also say Astaghfirullah. Now our istighfar is accepted and backbiting is, not, is no longer a sin. This is not that tawbah which is accepted in the court of Allah. Even if we make it, keep making this kind of tawbah, we will never be blessed with steadfastness in tawbah. Many people, they will be walking on the streets. They may see someone, a gay mahram woman, they will look at her and they may say, Astaghfirullah, these women don't do hijab, they don't cover themselves. You're looking at her, staring at her, and then you're saying istighfar as well, and you think that is tawbah, and this tawbah will be accepted, and this sin I will not be held accountable for. A lot of people think that is tawbah. So that is not that tawbah which will purify us from the sins of the past. The tawbah that will purify us from the sins of the past is that tawbah which is done according to the principles of Sharia. So therefore, it's important that we learn the basics of tawbah. That's one obstacle for our youngsters. A lot of our young people, they don't make tawbah because when they make tawbah, they think they can't maintain it. And those youngsters who make tawbah, after making tawbah, they search for the right path and then they find themselves with those who are deviants, those who are innovators, those who say that the Prophet sallallahu doesn't know us, the Prophet sallallahu as wasila is not permissible, calling upon the awliya of Allah is an act of shit, calling upon the beloved of Allah sallallahu is an act of shit. Many of our youngsters, those who choose the path of tawbah, they end up with radical Muslims, with terrorists, with people who misquote verses of the Quran, people who will say in Surah Tawbah, Allah Jalla wa'ala says, Uqtulul Mushrikeena, kill all the Mushrikeen, go out there and kill all the non-Muslims, whichever state you find them in, go and kill them. Now, these verses of the Quran are misquoted by people, mistranslated by people, and a lot of our young people, they join with these terrorists, and they think that they are serving the deen of Allah Jalla wa'ala, alayya sabillah which in reality has nothing to do with Islam. Terrorism has nothing to do with Islam. Allah Jalla's commands about saving humanity are very clear in the Quran. But many of our young people, the first obstacle that they have in order for them to do tawbah is that they do not know the practical methods of tawbah. They do not know how to make tawbah. Those who make tawbah, they choose the path of Islam. What happens to them after choosing the path of Islam? They end up with deviants, those people who make them terrorists. So we have to give a solution for both. Then how do we select and choose the right path, which is the path, according to us, is the path of Ahlul Sunnati Wal Jama'ah. But inshallah, if we act upon these basic principles of Tawbah, Allah will bless you with the nur of Tawbah, and Allah will bless you with Istiqamah and Tawbah. Now the question is, how do we make Tawbah? Remember there are four prerequisites of Tawbah, four conditions of Tawbah, four shahid of Tawbah. These four prerequisites of tawbah, you can memorize them by learning the word pram. Pram. Say the word pram. Pram. P R A M. P R A M. Pram. If you memorize the word pram, 
Then inshallah ta'ala, you will understand the basic prerequisites of Tawbah. The letter P in Pran stands for past. Our ulama, our fuqaha, they say, if a person makes Tawbah from the sins that he may commit in the future, that's taqwa, that's abstinence. If you say, oh Allah, if I tell a lie in the future, I make Tawbah in advance. This Tawbah is not that Tawbah which will purify you from the sinful acts. Tawbah that purifies you from the sinful acts is that Tawbah which is made from sins committed in the past. So the first prerequisite of Tawbah, the first condition of Tawbah is to make Tawbah from the sins that you have committed in the past. And acknowledging the sins of the past. Believing that this is a sin. For instance, if you backbited someone, or if you physically tortured someone, if you hit someone, and then you say, I don't believe that it's a sin. I don't believe that backbiting is a sin. I don't believe that telling a lie is a sin. But I make Tawbah. That Tawbah is not accepted Tawbah. Why? Because it's not a law. Acknowledging the sin that you've committed in the past is necessary for the Tawbah to be accepted. So, in Pran, the word P, the letter P stands for the sin of the past. And acknowledging the sin of the past, that I believe, O oh Allah, that I have committed a sin. I believe that it is a sin. And I repent from this sin that I committed in the past. For instance, if you told a lie, then you realize that this is a sin. I will be held accountable for it in the hereafter. Oh Allah, this lie that I have told in the past, I believe that it is a sin and I make Tawbah from this sinful act or I accept my Tawbah. This is the first condition of Tawbah. So in the letter, in the word, the acronym uh, Pran, the first letter is P. And P stands for? P stands for? P stands for? Acknowledging the sin of the past. Say, Ya Allah, I repent from this sin and I believe that this sin that I have committed in the past is a sin and I make Tawbah from it. That's the first condition of Tawbah. The second prerequisite of Tawbah is to have remorse. To have remorse. Pram. P-R. If you memorize this, it's very easy. At the end, I will ask you and inshallah, you will all know the practical method of Tawbah. It is a bid'ah. It is an innovation. If someone says to you that Prove plan from the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. We can't prove it. Huh? This is sharabe kun that jamil no. Huh? The sharab is old, but the, the containers in which I'm, I'm giving you the sharab are, are new containers. Pemane nee hai sharab pani. Huh? Meaning whatever I'm presenting, it is from the Quran and the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But the method is a unique method. It's a new method. As long as it is established from the Sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and every point for that we have the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But it's the simple method, so everyone can everyone can memorize it. The second condition of accepting tawbah is to have remorse. To have remorse, sharmindagi, nadamat, sharm sari ki kafir pada karma. Oh Allah, I'm ashamed of my sin. Oh Allah, I'm ashamed of this act. Oh Allah, if I committed this sin in front of my parents. I would never be able to confront them. Ya Allah, what face will I show to you on the day of judgment? Ya Allah, how will I face Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? I claim to love the beloved of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I believe that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has the knowledge of whatever I do. Ya Allah, I deliver lectures about the ilm al ghaib of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ya Allah, I sing praises of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ya Allah, in my talks, in the gatherings, in the nights, I say, Huzoor jaamte hain, Huzoor jaamte hain sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We all say that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam knows us, he sees us. Ya Allah, how can I have the audacity to commit such an evil sin when the Prophet ﷺ is observing my state? He knows my state, he sees me, and Ya Allah, how can I have this jura'ah? How can I have the audacity of committing a sin in front of you? What face will I show you on the day of judgment? Ya Allah, I'm ashamed of myself. To create this feeling, to have remorse, is the second condition of Tawbah. So what is the first condition of Tawbah? To repent from the sins committed in the past. And the second condition of Tawbah to have? To have remorse. That's the second shot of Tawbah. Pran. A. A stands for Allah. To make Tawbah only for the sake of Allah. To repent only for the pleasure of Allah Jalla wa'ala. Not for dunya. Tawbah not for dunya. Only to please Allah Jalla wa'ala. When we make Tawbah for the pleasure of Allah Jalla wa'ala, that is that Tawbah which will purify you from all the sins of the past. For the sake of Allah. For instance, if you committed a sin, and someone has seen you committing a sin, and that person is looking at you, 
And then you, you're scared of him. And you think this person will go out and he will expose me. He will tell the world about it. And say, oh Allah, oh Allah, save me this time. Oh Allah, cover my sin this time. Oh Allah, I beg you to cover my sin this time. May this person never go and tell anyone about me. Ya Allah, make Toba will never sin again. That is to avoid being exposed. That Toba is not for the sake of Allah. Do you see? The Toba which is accepted and which purifies you from all the sins of the past. That is that Tawbah which is only done for the sake of Allah, for the pleasure of Allah Jalla wa'ala, and out of the fear of Allah Jalla wa'ala. So if you think he will expose me, remember, making Tawbah for the sake of dunya, that's a sign of a modest person. Yet ek bahaya insaan ki alamat hai. Ujh log bilkul bahaya ho jate hai. Na Allah kadar ko dunya kar hai. So this is a sign of modesty. The person is a modest person. At least he fears people. But this is not that Tawbah which will purify you from all the sins of the past. The Tawbah that purifies you from all the sins of the past it is that Tawbah which is only done for the pleasure of Allah Jalla wa'ala. For instance, you have a fight with someone. Yeah? You beat him up and then he warns you. He said, I will go, I'm going to put my back up now. I will call all my boys and they will come and attack you. They will hit you back. Now you think, ah, oh, this guy. He's a hard guy, he's a hard knock, he's a known guy in the community. He's the toughest in the town. He's got a lot of backup. He will go and he, he will call his people and they will attack me. He said, Ya Allah, save me this time. I will never hit him again. Ya Allah, save me this time. I make Tawbah. I repent from the sins of the past. Ya Allah, protect me. What are you doing? Are you making this Tawbah for the sake of Allah? This is to avoid a beating. Huh? This is not for the sake of Allah, is it? This is to protect yourself from the attacks in dunya, not for the sake of Allah. You've committed a crime. And then you see the police has come to arrest you. You say, Ya Allah, save me this time. Ya Allah, save me this time. I will never commit this crime again. Yes? Is this all for the sake of Allah? This is to avoid the imprisonment. Yes? This is for dunya. So all these tawbahs are for the sake of dunya. The tawbah that purifies you from all the sins of the past, it is that tawbah which is only done for the pleasure of Allah. Jalla wa ala. So what do you do? If you committed a sin, now our spiritual masters of al Sufiya, they say for a beginner, he should think about the punishments. Later on, or when he's a sadiq, when he's a spiritual person, then even the displeasure of Allah is a great punishment for that person. In the beginning, the punishment is the azab in the qabr, the azab in the hereafter. But for a true believer, for a true mu'min, for a true Sufi, the greatest punishment is that my Lord is displeased with me. Allah is displeased with me. So the displeasure of Allah itself is a great punishment for a sadiq for a person who is on a spiritual path. But for beginners, it is important that we begin to think about the punishments. If you've committed a sin, think about the punishments of the Qabr. Think about the accountability in the hereafter. Think about the azab of Allah Jalla wa ala, and then say, Oh Allah, I make tawbah from this sin of the past only for your sake, Ya Allah. Because of your fear and because of your pleasure. Ya Allah, to please you, make this tawbah. I repent only for your pleasure, not for the sake of dunya. You see, not for the sake of dunya. Sometimes I see a lot of people, they, they join spiritual paths. Why do they do that? And this is a common disease in our community that people give fire because they have a problem obstacle in dunya. For instance, uh, someone is not successful in the trade, in the business, they will go to a sheikh, they will say, I want to become your muri. Why? So these obstacles in my path are removed and Allah Jalla wa ala, opens the doors of risk for me. So I give baya and the sheikh says, okay, you must repent from the sins of the past. So he says, okay, I repent from the sins of the past. Now why is this person repenting? Is he repenting for the sake of Allah? If he is, then that's good, mashallah. The awliya, the sufiya, they tell people to make tawbah for the sake of Allah. Obviously their intention is pure. They tell them to make tawbah, to repent from the sins of the past for the sake of Allah. But a lot of muridun, a lot of followers, they say, Peer Sahib, Sheikh Sahib, I make Tawbah, I will never sin again. But what's in their mind? Their business. They call Allah, they trade. I will pray my Salah, Allah will give me success in dunya. So that is Tawbah for the sake of dunya. Someone's got a court case, an obstacle in dunya. They go to a sheikh, I do Tawbah. He says, make Tawbah, start your prayers, I do Tawbah. But he starts establishing his prayer for the sake of dunya. Not for the sake of Allah. So it's important, any time in the future a sin is committed, we think about the four conditions of Tawbah. And the Tawbah is done only for the sake of Allah Jalla wa ala. So once again, what is the first condition of Tawbah? Everyone should say it now. To repent from the sins of the past. What is the second condition of Tawbah? To have? 
Excellent, mashallah. What is the third condition of Tawbah? For the sake of Allah. Only for the sake of Allah. Remember, how long does it take to think like this? Huh? Ten seconds. Ten seconds to think, Ya Allah, I've committed this sin. I repent. I believe that this is a sin. The sin of the past. And I make Tawbah. Ten seconds. Another ten seconds. Ya Allah, I'm ashamed of myself. Ya Allah, I'm ashamed of myself. How will I confront you on the day of judgment? Ya Allah, forgive me. Ya Allah, I wouldn't face my parents if I committed this sin, if they were seeing in this sin. Ya Allah, I make tawbah. Ya Allah, forgive me. I will never do this again. To have remorse. And then 10 seconds, another 10 seconds. Ya Allah, I'm not making this tawbah to please dunya. This is only for your pleasure and to avoid your displeasure and to avoid your, your punishment. For the sake of Allah, Jalla And the fourth condition, what is the fourth prerequisite of tawbah? And never again. Ya Allah, make a firm intention. I make a firm intention from the bottom of my heart. Ya Allah, I will never sin again with your help, Ya Allah. With your help. A lot of our people, they say, I will not sin again from now on. And everyone says, yes, I will not. I make a firm intention now. I will never sin again. I make tawbah. But we forget. How can we make tawbah without the help of Allah? So it's important we say, Oh Allah, never again with your help, Ya Allah. With your help, Ya Allah. Because without your help, I can never make tawbah. Remember, we can never maintain our tawbah without the help of Allah Jalla Ma'ala. So this fourth condition is to make a firm decision from the depths of our heart. Ya Allah, we make a firm intention from this day forth. With your help, we will never sin again. That is the fourth condition of tawbah. Remember, when we make this fourth near and never again, Satan will whisper. Say, you know, what's the point of making this Tawbah? You know, you know that you will end up sinning again. You made Tawbah in the past. Then you invalidated it. Then you made Tawbah. Then you keep breaking it and you keep making it. Constantly making Tawbah and you make an intention that you will never sin again. Well, you know, this will displease Allah. This is a mockery of Tawbah. Satan says that to us. This is a mockery of Tawbah. Huh? You're making a joke out of Tawbah. You know that you can't maintain your Tawbah. You can't attain steadfastness in Tawbah. Satan will remind you, you know, you've got these contact numbers of so and so, you will speak to her. You know that, you know, you can't just throw away your SIM card. You can't delete all the numbers. You may be committing some other harams. You know, you're addicted to drugs. And you come to this gathering and you're making Tawbah. What's the point of this Tawbah? You know, you know you'll end up committing sins again. When Satan says that to you, we have to answer. We have to have our ammunition ready. It's important that we know the answers. These are common satanic whispers. As soon as Satan says that to you, say to Satan, Oh Satan, you cannot deceive me. You cannot deceive me. I came to this gathering which was organized by PMT and there I learned the practical methods of Tawbah. And one of the fourth prerequisites of Tawbah, the fourth prerequisite of Tawbah was to persuade yourself that I will not sin again with the help of Allah Jalla wa'ala. I make Tawbah with the help of Allah Jalla wa'ala. As long as at the time of Tawbah, you have persuaded yourself that with the help of Allah you will never sin again, that Tawbah is accepted and it purifies you from all the sins of the past. But O oh Satan, O oh Satan, if I end up committing a sin again, as long as at the time of Tawbah, now presently at the time of Tawbah, I have persuaded myself I will never sin again. But if due to the weakness of my Iman, my nafs takes control over me, and if because of my weakness, I end up sinning again, I will make Tawbah again. As long as at the time of Tawbah, I have persuaded myself, I will never sin again. That's the condition, isn't it? At the time of Tawbah, we must persuade ourselves, we will never sin again with the help of Allah. Oh Satan, if I end up sinning again, I will make Tawbah again. This Tawbah, which is made with sincerity for the sake of Allah, with the pre four prerequisites of Tawbah, this will purify me from all the sins of the past. So you cannot deceive me, O oh Satan. You cannot deprive me from the name of Tawbah only because of a minute possibility of me committing a sin again. If I end up sinning again, as long as I have persuaded myself now that I will not sin again, Tawbah is accepted. If I end up committing a sin again, then I will make Tawbah again. We say that to Satan and we say that and we say and then we make Tawbah with the four conditions of Tawbah. Remember, this is a common whisper of Satan. He makes us think like that. Or well, you can think of an example. The example is, if you were told to carry four bricks on your head, how many bricks? 
four bricks. Four bricks you were carrying on your head. You were carrying the burden, the weight of four bricks on your head. And then the person who told you to pick them up, he tells you, I'll let you throw them away. Yeah? I'll let you throw them away. You say to that person, what's the point of me throwing these away now? There's a possibility of me picking up another one. He tells you, I'll let you throw them away. And you respond by saying, what is the point of me throwing this four away? I may end up picking up another one. Huh? There's another one, the fifth one. I may pick up another one. So if I may end up picking up another one, so what's the point of me throwing these four away? What would you say? Stupidity, isn't it? That's stupidity. You will say to that person, if he's giving you the option of throwing away the four, and you're not throwing them away only because of a possibility of you picking up, picking up another one, just because of that, you're not throwing away the four that you're carrying. If you end up picking up another one, then you will only be carrying the burden of one, the weight of one. But if you keep the four on your head, and then you end up picking up another one, then you will be carrying five. Do you understand what I'm saying? So if someone doesn't throw away the four only because of the possibility of picking up another one, then you will say he's a stupid person, because he's letting you throw away the four. Do you understand? Do you understand the point I'm trying to make? You know when Satan says to you, do not make Tawbah. Why? You may end up sinning again. Huh? You may end up sinning again. Now, you will say to Satan, if I end up sinning again, that will be one sin. I will be committing one sin. But you are depriving me from the mercy of Allah Jalla wa Allah. I'm carrying the burden of millions and trillions of sins. As long as at the time of Tawbah, I have persuaded myself that I will not sin again, Allah will forgive all the sins of the past. Just because of a possibility of carrying the burden of one more sin, you are depriving me from the forgiveness of all the sins of the past. I will not listen to you, Satan. If I've committed one million sins, yes, I will be forgiven. All the million sins of will be forgiven. And if I end up sinning again, that will only be one sin. As long as at the time of Tawbah, I have no intention of sinning again, my Tawbah will be accepted and I will be forgiven from all the sins of the past. So we have to have the examples ready. The moment Satan whispers and says, what if, what if? You say, I will not think about what if. Because when I made the Tawbah, with the four conditions of Tawbah, I persuaded myself that with the help of Allah, I will make Tawbah. You know, recently, a brother came to one of our gatherings in UK. This brother was a, was a drug dealer, also a drug addict. So, our brothers invited him, they gave him da'a, invited him to the gathering, and we make a collective du'a. And during our collective du'a, you see a lot of young people shedding tears in the remembrance of Allah Jalla wa ala, and, you know, they think about the sinful acts, and they make tawbah. So this guy came, and he was observing everyone. And the brothers told him, brother, you should make Tawbah. You should do Tawbah. You know, all of these people said, ah, you know, this is, this is not my path. This is not my sin. You don't know what the sins I commit. This is not for me. It's not some young bearded guy invited me to this gathering. And he's been asking me for such a long time. So I thought I might as well keep him happy. I came to this gathering, but I had no intention of choosing this path. The brothers told him, brother, you, you were born in a Muslim family. Look at all these rivers. Look at all these white people, look at all these black brothers, these brothers were non-Muslims. And look at them shedding tears in the love of Allah Jalla wa ala. Why don't you make Tawbah? He said, well, you know, I have many commitments. I'm committing many, many sins. So it's impossible. What's the point of this hypocritical Tawbah? This is hypocrisy. You know, if I make Tawbah, I know I will not be able to maintain Tawbah. What's the point of me making this Tawbah? Then the brothers told him, four predictors of Tawbah. What are they? Plan. To repent from the sins of the to have? Everyone. 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 You know, when I speak uh, in England, I have to explain it in Urdu also. Yeah? Because I see a lot of Bazurks, a lot of elderly people who do not understand English at all. But I was told that all the Bazurks here, they all understand English. Yes? So can you prove that to me? So what is the first condition of Tawbah? To make Tawbah from the sins of the? Everyone, from the sins of the? Ah. Second condition, to have? Oh. Third condition? Oh. For the sake of? Oh. Allah. And fourth condition? Oh. Never again. Never again. Uh -huh. If you want to, and this is the problem, even with the deviants. But the Kidakasabi must 
وہ ایک شخص تھا اس نے کہا کہ اگر کوئی بندہ مجھے یہ مسئلہ سمجھا دے تو میں اپنی ساری جائیداد اس کے نام پہ کر دوں گا اگر کوئی بندہ یہ مسئلہ مجھے سمجھا دے تو میں اپنی ساری جائیداد اس کے نام پہ کر دوں گا اس کی زوجہ نے کہا اس کی وائف نے کہا اللہ کے بندے ہمارا تو خیال کرتا اس شہر میں بڑے بڑے دانشوار ہیں بڑے بڑے انٹلیکچوئل ہیں بڑے بڑے پڑھے لکھے ہیں اگر کسی نے سمجھا دیا تو پھر کیا کرے گا اپنے بچوں کا خیال کرتا تجھے تو جائیداد نہیں چاہیے تو نے کہا میں اپنی ساری جائیداد اس کے نام پہ کر دوں گا اس نے کہا بڑے بڑے دانشور ہوں گے بڑے بڑے مفقرین ہوں گے بڑے بڑے انٹلیکچوئل ہوں گے مجھے سمجھائیں گے کیسے میں نے سمجھنا ہی نہیں تو کوئی سمجھائے گا کیسے جب میں خود سمجھوں گا ہی نہیں تو کوئی سمجھائے گا کیسے میں تو خود کہوں گا کہ میں نے سمجھنا نہیں تو کچھ ایسے بھی ہوتے ہیں بتا کیدا کی بھی سب سے بڑی پرابلم یہ ہے وہ سمجھنا چاہتے ہی نہیں تو ہم سمجھائیں گے ایسے تو جو سمجھنا چاہے گا انشاء اللہ تعالیٰ وہ وہ سمجھ جائے گا اور پھر کچھ سمجھانے والا بھی ایسے ہوتے ہیں وہ بھی ایک پرابلم ہے نا وہ ایک حکیم صاحب تھے نا حکیم صاحب وہ قبرستان میں جب بھی جاتے ہیں تو چہرے پر نکاح اوڑھ لے گئے نکاح کر کے قبرستان میں جاتے ہیں تو کسی نے پوچھا حکیم صاحب یہ قبرستان میں آپ چہرے پر نکاح کیوں اوڑھ لیتے ہیں چہرہ چھپاتے کیوں ہیں انہوں نے کہا اصل میں میں ان مردوں سے شرماتا ہوں کہا کیوں شرماتے ہو کہا اکثر ان میں میرے علاج کی وجہ سے قبرستان میں پہنچا انہوں نے کہا اس لیے میں ان سے شرماتا ہوں تو کچھ ہمارے نیم حکیم ایسے ہوتے ہیں سمجھانے والے بھی ایسے ہیں کچھ سمجھنے والے بھی ایسے ہیں کرون بہت آسان لینگویج میں پیش کر رہا ہوں تو what is the first condition of power to depend from the sins committed in the second condition of power to have third condition of power to depend only for the sake of fourth condition of power never again کبھی بھی نہیں کرنا ہے اللہ تیرے کرم سے I will never sin again یا اللہ with your help never again that's the fourth condition of power so and inshallah for me itself you know this itself is a big achievement I will come to the issues of aqeedah but if I know that you people have understood the practical method of Tawbah this itself is a big achievement Alhamdulillah I can see about 90% of people have understood and learned the practical methods and I will get reward for that you will get reward for that all the organizers will be rewarded for that because these young people the Bazaars the elderly people whoever will make Tawbah in the future they will remember the word plan they will remember that they will make Tawbah and the organizers of these gatherings will be rewarded and all the reward of the Tawbah of all the people who have come here will be given to those people who have organized this event Alhamdulillah Allah. so this young lad then said and he saw that there's a lot of people are making Tawbah and he said okay if I just persuade myself for the time being in this gathering that I will never sin again will my Tawbah be accepted? will I, Allah accept my Tawbah? the brothers told him yes Allah will accept your Tawbah brothers we witnessed this spectacle ourselves in the gathering when we were making dua this young brother was shedding tears in the, in the fear of Allah and the love of Allah Jalla wa ala. and he made toba. in the gathering he made toba. he was crying shedding tears in the fear of Allah Jalla. we have our gatherings on every Friday in UK in Birmingham this was a Friday night he made toba. as I told you this was a drug dealer a person who had nothing to do with Islam and no one could have ever imagined him doing Tawbah in a gathering. He attended one gathering, he made Tawbah. He made Tawbah on Friday. Saturday, Sunday. After these two days, on Monday, one of our Jamaat brothers, they took him to a masjid, local masjid in our area. At Salatul Maghrib time, the time of Maghrib, he was making wudu in the masjid. He had a heart attack and he passed away. He had a heart attack and he passed away. You know, even if he committed a sin after Friday, how many sins would there be? How many sins? Saturday, Sunday, how many? But Allah Jalla wa ala purified him from all the sins of the past. Huh? Just because of that motivation by some young people, make Tawbah brother, make Tawbah. And today that brother, that drug dealer, that drug addict, that sinful man who is from UK, is being mentioned in South Africa. How fortunate. Huh? How fortunate. And in almost every gathering of ours, we make Tawbah for him. We ask Allah for his forgiveness. Huh? This is how merciful our Lord is. So if Satan makes you think, what if you sin again? What? Tell Satan. Oh Satan, you cannot deceive me as long as I have acted upon the four conditions of Tawbah and I have persuaded myself that I will never sin again with the help of Allah Jalla wa ala, this Tawbah will be accepted. It's a Sahih Hadith of Sayyid Bukhari. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam said, a person commits a sin and after sinning, he realizes that he has a Rabb, he has a Lord who holds people accountable and he also forgives people. He says, Oh Allah, I have committed a sin. 
But Ya Allah, I know that you are most forgiving. Ya Allah, you hold people accountable and you also forgive people. Ya Allah, I make you a witness that I do Toba. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, This person makes Toba, Allah accepts his Toba. Then for some time, this person doesn't sin. After some time, Satan attacks him and the person commits a sin again. This is the mafhum of the hadith of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, When this person commits a sin again, after committing a sin, once again he says, Ya Allah, I've committed a sin, but I know that I have a Rabb, I have Allah who is most forgiving, and He also holds people accountable. Oh Allah, I make Tawbah again. The Prophet said, The second time he makes Tawbah, Allah Jalla accepts his Tawbah, and Allah Jalla forgives his sin. Rasulullah said, Then this person ends up committing a sin again. He ends up committing a sin again. The Prophet said, The third time when he commits a sin, after committing a sin, once again he says, Oh Allah, I have committed a sin, but I know that I have a Rabb, I have a Lord who is most forgiving. Ya Allah, I know that I have a Rabb who holds people accountable and who also forgives people. Ya Allah, I make you a witness that I make Tawbah. And once again, accepts his Tawbah and forgives all the sins of the past. And then the Prophet said that Allah then says, now he may do whatever he wants to do. Now he may do whatever he wants to do. Now what is the meaning of this jumla of Rasulullah Now he may do whatever he wants to do. The Sharahi, that this constant tawbah, continuously making tawbah, it pleases Allah Jalla wa'ala so much. It pleases Allah Jalla wa'ala so much. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala becomes so happy with him that Allah gives him a tuhfa. Allah gives him a gift. What is the gift by Allah Jalla wa'ala? Allah says he may do whatever he wants to do. The meaning of that is, Ya Abd, O oh Abd, O oh slave of mine, your constant tawbah has pleased me so much that now you may do whatever you want to do. Meaning, now even if you try committing a sin, my mercy will become a barrier between you and the sin. Even if you try committing a sin, I will not let you commit a sin. Ah. This is the mercy of Allah Jalla wa'ala. Even if you try committing a sin, I will not allow you to sin. Huh? This is how Ghafoor Rahim our Lord is. How Kareem our Lord is. How loving our Lord is. You know some youngsters, they come to me, they say, Shaykh, you know, I sometimes I have an opportunity of committing major sins. And I even make an intention of committing major sins. I try committing them. But suddenly something comes in, in between and just stops me from sinning. I have such a barrier. I leave my home. I go out to commit a sin. I make an intention of committing a sin. But somehow something comes and stops me from sinning. What is that? You know, these are the people who are chosen by Allah Jalla wa'ala. This is the ni'mah of Allah Jalla wa'ala. This is the great karam of Allah Jalla wa'ala. But don't take it for granted. Don't keep doing that. Do not keep abusing the rahmah of Allah Jalla wa'ala. If you are chosen by Allah, if you accept it by Allah, and Allah Jalla wa'ala has blessed you with his presence, that even if you try committing a sin, he stops you and some force stops you and doesn't let you commit a sin, then thank Allah Jalla wa'ala and make a firm intention in this gathering. Oh Allah, we are ashamed of our sins. Ya Allah, we repent from all the sins that we have committed. Ya Allah, we have remorse and we are ashamed of our sins. Oh Allah, we are not making tawbah for the pleasure of dunya, only for your pleasure, Ya Allah. And Ya Allah, we make a firm intention from this day forth, we will never sin with your help. And inshallah, Allah Jalla wa'ala will bless you with this tikama in tawbah. Do we make niyyah inshallah? That's the first step towards tawbah. Then when we make tawbah, and remember, if we make tawbah, this is between the abd and the ma'bud, and then the huquq al-ibad, huquq Allah, the rights of the creation of Allah Jalla wa'ala. I'll give you one example. If someone has become a drug addict because of you, and you've come to this gathering to make tawbah, remember, in the hereafter, the sin that has been committed by that person who was influenced by you. For instance, you go to a gathering of zikr, you go to a gathering of Islam, and then you're motivated to do Tawbah. But many young people have become sinful because of you. You make Tawbah, according to one narration, in the hereafter, you will be held accountable for the sins committed by that person. According to one narration, on the Day of Judgment, a person will be raised and as a, a pious person. He will think that he has ibadah, he has salah, he has song, he has taqwa, he has given sadaqah in the path of Allah Jalla wa'ala. But suddenly, mountains of haram will be placed in his book of deeds. He says, Ya Allah, I didn't commit these sins. 
Ya Allah, I should commit haram. Ya Allah, I need to take drugs. Ya Allah, I wasn't a drunkard. Ya Allah, I made tawbah at the age of 20. When I was 20 years old, I made tawbah. These sins are not my sins. It will be said to him, you didn't commit these sins, but because of your company, because of your influence, when you were a young lad, so and so became a drug addict because of you. So and so became a drunkard because of you. So and so became a fornicator because of you. So and so became an adulterer because of you. So and so became a liar because of you. He committed all of these sins. You made Toba, but now you will be held accountable for the sins by those people also. So it's important when we make Toba. We don't only make Toba. One is the Toba. This is the ta'aluk between the Abd and the Ma'bud. Between the servant, the worshipper, and the one who is worshipped. But also, they have Ubul Ibad. The rights of the community, rights of the creation of Allah Jalla wa also. So what do we do? Our ulama say, we should make niyyah, when we make tawbah, that anyone who was corrupted by me, anyone who, who became sinful because of my company, I will approach that person, I will meet that person, and I will ask him to forgive me. That's important. And then I will ask him to make tawbah. And I will say, look brother, I used to commit those sins, but I have made tawbah. And I request you to make tawbah. Our ulama say, as long as you have conveyed the message and you've tried your best, then his sins will not be written in your account. In our organization, every member of our organization, they have a notebook. And we tell people, whenever you're driving the car, you're at your workplace, wherever you are, keep thinking about the people who were corrupted because of us. And write their name down. If you can't find them, think that whenever I will meet this person, if you know where the person lives, for instance, when you were at school, you used to tell lies, someone became a liar because of you. You told someone to watch a haram movie, that person watched a haram movie and got addicted to that. And you made tawbah, but he continued to commit those sins. Make note of the name and make an intention. If you know where he lives, go to his house and convey the message to him. So that his sins are not written in your account. But if that person, he lives in a different place, you don't know the whereabouts of the person, then make niya and write the name of the person. I will approach the person. Whenever I meet him, I will ask him to forgive me and I will ask him to make tawbah. Also, if we have tortured someone, if we have physically abused someone, if you hit someone, or if you fail to fulfill the rights of the creation of Allah by taking someone's good, goods by force. For instance, if you take someone's money, then you have to pay back. And if you don't have the money, then you have to make an intention. Whenever you will have it, you will pay back. And if you are a poor person, you go to that person and you say to that person, I'm a poor person, but remember, at that time, I took your mal, your goods by force. Now, I'm present here at your service. If you want me to serve you, I'll serve you. I do not have the money, but I'm willing to serve you. If he forgives you, most people will just forgive. They'll be motivated. They'll think, SubhanAllah, this person wants to make tawbah. He's making tawbah, so they will forgive you. If they don't, then present yourself, say, I'm at your service. Whatever you want me to do, I will serve you. Because I can't pay back, but we accept my service. If you hit someone, if you tortured someone, then you have to go back to them. And you have to say to them, brother, remember that time I hit you? Now I want you to take revenge. I'd rather take the beating here in dunya than to give my good deeds to you on the day of judgment. Because then we have to give our good deeds to the person who we have abused in dunya. And then once you've said that, if he hits you, alhamdulillah, take the beating, huh? because it will save you from the punishments in the hereafter. And if he doesn't, if he forgives you, then that will suffice. That is sufficient. And remember, if someone comes to you to seek forgiveness, it is important that we forgive them. According to one hadith of Rasulullah if a person, if a Muslim oppresses another Muslim, and the one who was oppressed, the one who was oppressed, was approached by the oppressor, the Zalim Muslim comes to the Muslim Muslim. If you hit someone, yes, you oppressed him. He's the Muslim, he's the one who's oppressed. The oppressor goes to the oppressed, approaches him, and he says, Brother, forgive me, I oppressed you. Remember, it is necessary that the Muslim forgives the one of the one hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said the mafroom of the hadith is if he doesn't forgive the Muslim on the day of judgment, he will be deprived from drinking also with the hands of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's the greatest punishment for a lover of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If a Muslim comes to you and seeks forgiveness, 
Forgive him immediately. Because if you don't forgive him, then you will be deprived from drinking from Jose Koser with the hands of Rasulullah And this is a great punishment for, for any ashik of Rasulullah So if he doesn't forgive you, as long as you wrote the person, then inshallah, ta'ala, you will be forgiven. Also, if you backbite someone, if you backbite someone, and you know that your act of backbiting has reached that person, meaning the one that you backbited, knows that you backbited him. For instance, Mr. A says to Mr. B that Mr. C has told a lie. Yes? A told B that C told a lie. Now, B goes and tells C that A said this about you, that you are a liar. A now knows that C knows that B told him. Yes? A knows that C knows that B told him. Then it's wajib upon A to go to C and say, Brother, I backbited you. I know that you know that I backbited you. I seek forgiveness. But if A knows that C doesn't know that A has backbited C, then he will never go to him and tell him, I used to backbite you, I ask you for forgiveness. Remember that. Then the Tawbah is between you and Allah. You see? Because if you approach him and tell him, that will create hatred in his heart for you. If he doesn't know, then it's between you and Allah. These are some basic principles. They are Allah, then they are prayers, the Qaza Umri of Salah, the Qaza Umri of Fasting. But remember, the first step for it is plan. is to make Tawbah with the four pre-religions of Tawbah and make an intention. Now this should not demotivate you. Okay, I will make Tawbah, but then I have to do everything else. Although it's easy, only plan, that's fine. Yes, that is sufficient. But we have to make an intention of acting upon all the other conditions of Tawbah also. If we make this Tawbah, then after that, we work on seven gates of the heart. The eyes, the tongue, the ears, the stomach, the private parts, and the feet. These are the seven gates of the heart whereby Satan poisons the human heart. And according to our spiritual manhaj, we work on each gate for 40 days. So for 40 days, we control our eyes from looking at haram. After the completion of 40 days, we add the tongue, the sins of the tongue. Because a lot of people think it's very easy. I make talk from all the sins of the past and then they end up sinning. So there's a procedure to this. If you control your eyes, so basically this is a, a door, a gate on the heart. We have to lock the gate. We have to put a padlock on. Yes? How do we do that? For 40 consecutive days, we do not look at haram. And just say after 30 days, you end up looking at haram, then we say, now nah, that has invalidated the tazkiyah. This is called the tazkiyah. Then you start all over again for 40 days. Even if it takes you one year to complete 40 days, consecutively purifying your eyes, then even, even if it takes a year, that is fine. As long as you have the intention of closing this first gate of the heart. Then once the 40 days are complete, then you add the tongue. Then those 40 days, consecutive 40 days, after 39 days, you, tell, you told a lie. You misuse your tongue. Then you complete the 40 days. Then you start all over again and complete the 40 days. Once the tongue is complete, then add the ear, then the hands, then the stomach, then the private parts, then the feet. Once the seven gates are closed, then spiritual litanies are given. Aurad are given. Khas aurad are given to you. That opens the spiritual eye in the heart. A spiritual eye is open in the heart and that gives you the lure of Iman. And then after that, you will begin to hate sins. Then if you look at a very mahram woman, you will feel that someone is placing balls made out of her in your eyes. Then no one has to tell you that if you look at haram, then you will have azab, azab, this punishment, that punishment, people. We get so much fear. There is no doubt Rasulullah is a nazir, but he is also a bashir. Rasulullah gave basharat also. And the Prophet didn't only scare people, Rasulullah also told people the practical methods of maintaining Tawbah, which our spiritual masters then took from Rasulullah So once the seven gates are closed, then we work on the purification of the mind, then the purification of the ruh. So this is the procedure of Tawbah. But the conclusion of this is the four conditions of Tawbah. So what is the first prerequisite of Tawbah? To repent from the sins of the? Ah. Second condition? Ah. Third? Ah. Fourth? Ah. Never again. 
When our young people, when they start making Toba, the next problem they have is deviance. Well, Akira. Many of our young people, they end up meeting some people who will say, do not go to the gatherings of Aulia, do not go to the gatherings of Sufiya. You will end up committing shirk. You will end up committing mid'ah, innovation. That's another problem. And what happens to them? Rather than it bringing a change in your life, apparently you will follow the ahkam of deen, but you become worse than what you were before. Because before the youngster was a sinful youngster, but at least he wasn't a man who insults the Prophet At least he wasn't someone who insults the awliya Allah. He was a sinful person, but he was a Muslim. He was a sinful person, but he was a believer. But what happens when this sinful person makes Toba? Many people, the next obstacle that they have is that they end up meeting deviants. And they begin to insult the beloved of Allah. Now, what's the solution for this? How will a person find out what is the right path, what is the wrong path? The first thing that he will be told is the Quran. That's what everyone says. Brother, Quran and Sunnah. I have Quran and Sunnah. I don't need anything else. I have the Quran and Sunnah. But the problem is, when you're told that follow the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet when he comes to our gatherings, we present Quran. When he goes to the gatherings of the deviants, they also present Quran. So what should a common person do? What's the solution for a common person? For someone who, is, who doesn't have knowledge of the sciences of Sharia, for instance. Someone tells him that we believe that the Prophet وسلم, is blessed with the knowledge of the unseen. Rasulullah Allah has blessed him with the knowledge of ghayb, ilmul ghayb. Now someone else says to him, no, the Prophet وسلم, doesn't know ilmul ghayb. But both are presenting verses of the Quran. One will say, look, Allah says in the Quran, that only Allah has the knowledge of the unseen. He will come to our gatherings. We will say, وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيَقْلِيَكُمْ عَلَى الْغَيْبِ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهُ يَجْتَبِهِ مَرُسُلِهِ مَنْ يَشَعْ Allah doesn't inform everyone of the knowledge of the unseen, but He chooses from His prophets. لِيَقْلِيَكُمْ عَلَى الْغَيْبِ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهُ يَجْتَبِهِ مَرُسُلِهِ مَنْ يَشَعْ From His prophets, from His rusul, from His messengers, whoever He chooses, He blesses them with the knowledge of the unseen. Now they are presenting Quran. These people are also presenting Quran. Then they will say, in Surah Jin, Allah Jalla wa'ala says, Ha'limul ghaybi fada yuzhiru wa'ala ghaybihi ahadan illa wa nil qadabi rasul. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is just with the knowledge of the NC. Allah Jalla wa'ala says in the Quran, wa ma huwa ala al-ghaybi bidani. The Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is just with the knowledge of the NC. Allah Jalla wa'ala says in the Quran, wa allama kama lam taqul ta'ala wa kana fadullahi alayka azimah. O beloved Allah Jalla wa'ala has blessed you with the knowledge of everything. Wa allama kama lam taqul ta'ala. This ma is for umum, and there is no muhassis, there is no specified. La yukhassasu qat'iyu bi zannim. A qat'i cannot be specified with a zannim. A generic kalam of Allah Jalla wa ala, wa'allamaka ma lam takun ta'ala wa qala fadullahi alayka azimah. O beloved Allah Jalla wa ala has blessed you with the knowledge of everything that you did not know. Quran is being presented. So they are presenting Quran, these people are presenting Quran. Okay, some people will say, the Prophet is dead. The Prophet is dead. Why? The Quran says, Inna kamayit. About the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Now this youngster will come to our garden. The ulama will say, Wala taqulu li man yuqtulu fi sadi illahi amwat. That even the shuhada alive. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's maqam is greater than the maqam of the martyrs. So if the martyrs are alive, then why wouldn't the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam be alive? Then they will say, إِنَّ اللَّهَ حَرَّمَ عَلَى الْأَرْضِ إِنْ تَأْقُولَ إِكْسَادَ الْأَنْبِيَاءِ فَالْنَبِيُّ اللَّهِ حَيٌّ That the Prophet of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم and the Prophets of Allah جل وعلا are all alive, your sakh, they are blessed with sustenance. They are presenting Quran, they are presenting Sunnah of Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم. Okay, he will go to some other people, they will say, look for them, the Quran says, وَمَا لَكُمْ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ مِنْ وَلِيٍّ وَلَا نَصِيرٍ Other than Allah, there there is no headquarter than Allah. Why? Who says it? The Quran says it. Only Allah is a wali. There is no one else. Only Allah is a wali. Only Allah is a rasi. Only Allah is a wali. Only Allah is a helper. None other than Allah can help. None other than Allah is a wali. They are presenting Quran. He will come to our gathering 
And our brothers will be saying, our ulama will be saying, إِنَّمَا وَلَيُّكُمُ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا الَّذِينَ يُكِيمُوا الصَّلَاةِ Allah is your wali. Rasulullah is also your wali. The pious people are also wali. Now common person will be confused. What should I do? I go there, they're presenting Quran. I come here, they're presenting Quran. Okay. He will say, someone will say, Let's look, Wasila is impermissible. Allah says, only seek help from Allah. Jalla Wasila is impermissible. It is haram to seek Wasila. It is shit to seek Wasila. He will come to our gathering. We will present verses of the Quran. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu taqullah wa abdawu ilayhi wasila. Allah Jalla wa'ala is ordering us to search for Wasila to gain the name of Allah Jalla wa'ala. What shall he do? What shall he do? Both of us are presenting verses of the Quran. Okay. He will go to another group of people. They will say, look, in Surah Tawbah, Allah says, uqtulul mushrikeen aizu wa jibtumu. Kill all the Mushriks, kill all the non-Muslims. This is the Quran. Quran says that. Now this youngster, when he will meet these people who misquote the verses of the Quran, he ends up with the terrorists. He comes to our gatherings. We say, Allah Jalla wa'ala says, مَنْ قَتَلَ نَفْسًا لِغَيْ نَفْسٍ وَفَسَادٍ فِرَدٍ فَكَأَنَّمَا قَتَلَ النَّفْسِ مِيَا That the one who kills a human, a human, unjustly, it is like killing all of humanity. Oh, it is impermissible to, to kill humans. That can be a Muslim or a non-Muslim. He's confused again. Saving the life of a human is like saving all humanity. Quran there, Quran here, what should I do? You see? And I can continue with this. You now we give dawah to non-Muslims. We answer the objections, the objections of Orientalists, the objections of the Christians, the objections of the Yahud and the Nasara, that's what we do. So we answer them. So we can continue with all the verses of the Quran that they present and the verses of the Quran that we present. But what is the solution? And then you'll find some people who will say, Ya Akhi, you know, I don't, I, don't, I don't believe in all this. I'm only a Muslim. Ya Akhi, I'm only a Muslim. Don't call me a Sunni. There's no need of applying the word Ahlu Sunnati wal Jama'ah. We are uniting the entire Ummah. We are bringing everyone together. You know, you are creating disruptions within the Ummah. So my definition given to me by the Quran is Muslim. So I am a Muslim. Do not call me a Sufi. Do not call me a Qadri. Do not call me a Sunni. Do not say I am from Ahlu Sunnati wal Jama'ah. I am a Muslim. I am a simple Muslim. Okay? Allah has given me this name. So, do not create divisions in the Ummah. That's another problem that we have. Why? The Prophet sallam, himself said that this Ummah will divide. This will take place. This is mentioned by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. No, I'm not making this up. These are hadiths of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And these are sahih hadiths of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The beloved of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said that this Ummah will divide. It will divide into 73 sects. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said 72 will be in hellfire and one will be in Jannah. And I have given detailed lectures about this. From the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that these people will be Ahlu Sunnati wal Jama'ah the people of Jannah. Now, if Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has mentioned this, this division will take place in Aqidah, in the creed, in things which are known with necessity in Islam and known with necessity in Ahlu Sunnati wal Jama'ah. People will deviate. This will happen. Now, are we trying to say that we will unite everyone and go against the prophecy of Rasulullah Can we do that? We can't do that. We have to at least clarify the belief of Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'ah. We need to protect our youth from these terrorists. It's important. Today in the entire world, Islam is being stigmatized with terrorism. Why is that happening? It's not because of us. It's not because of us. I mean, do you ever hear on, on, on TV channels, on the news, a Qadri terrorist? Huh? A Chishti terrorist? Fulan Dashat Gard, Sorvarti Dashat Gard. You know? The media, we know that the media, they manipulate so many. But in this thing, even they don't do it. Because they know that people will laugh at them. How can a Qadri be a terrorist? Huh? How can a Naqshbandi be a terrorist? Even they are aware of this. Even they know this. That no one will accept this. That a Sorvarti, a Chishti, a Naqshbandi, a Qadri will be a terrorist. That doesn't happen, yeah? So these things are done by those people. But the problem is, then we have some so-called enlightened Muslims. They sit with us, oh, Muslim, I'm a Muslim. They're not calling me a Sunni. I'll 
tell you some time back, I was traveling, um, I was coming back from Pakistan to UK, and um, in the airplane, there was this guy, and he said to me, you know, why did you go to Pakistan? I said, we had big events, and we had the event of the Sokuf, and he said, who are you? I said, I'm a Muslim. He said, what Aqeedah do you pastor? I'm Ahlul Sunnati Wal Jama'ah. He said, brother, don't say Ahlul Sunnati Wal Jama'ah. I'm a Muslim. I'm a simple Muslim, and that's what I believe in. I tried explaining it to him, so-called elite class of Pakistan. But you know, because he was trying to impress uh, other people listening that I'm an intellectual and I know Islam better. So I got tired and I fell asleep and I said, ignore this guy. I kept telling him, it's important to introduce yourself as, as Ahlul Sunnati Wal Jama'ah. This will happen, the Ummah will divide. But he wasn't accepting anything. When we landed at the airport, the officers, they checked my passport. Then he was right behind me. They stopped him. And they asked him, which city are you from? So he mentioned, they said, which mosque do you go to for Salah? First, he, know that he knew that I was listening. He said, what's that got to do with anything? They said, we need to know, which mosque do you go to? He said, that's the mosque I go to. Then they started asking, did you go to any other masajid? He said, listen to me. I'm a Muslim, but... They said, what kind of a Muslim are you? What kind of a Muslim? He said, listen, is it taking too long? You know that guy over there, he calls himself a Rizmi, Brahmi, Sufi, whatever he is, that's what I am. <laughs> that's what I am. Whatever he believes in, now he's forgotten his so-called, you know, intellectual Muslim. I'm a Muslim. I'm a Muslim. I'm a Muslim. Huh? What happens when the fire of terrorism has reached your house? Allah. Then you begin to call yourself Sufi, Sunni, Muslim. Huh? When, when it is the masala of the namus of Rasulullah the honor of Rasulullah then you forget defending the honor of the Prophet We all Muslim, all Muslims. These are double standards, aren't they? And then it's simple. I mean, this is something we can discuss this. But I want to give the solution. Say, say hadith of Sayyid Bukhari. You know, if someone said that to you, do not give me another definition. Do not describe me. I'm only a Muslim. Nothing but a Muslim. If someone said that to you, tell them. If you say to them, you're a Muslim, but which Aqeedah do you follow? What else are you? If they say, I will not answer the question. Do not ask me another question. Say, what will happen in the cover? The hadith of Sayyid Bukhari. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said, when a person is buried in his cover, and the first question that is asked, Man Rabbuk, who is your Lord? What does he say? Rabbi Allah, my Lord is Allah. The second question is asked, Ma Deenuk, what is your Deen? What's the answer? Deen is Islam, my Deen is Islam. When he said, my Deen is Islam, what is he saying? What is Islam? Aslam al Muslim, Islam is the Muslim. Muslim is a small five. So he's actually saying, I'm a Muslim. He has said this, yes? Acha, tell me, when he has said, I am a Muslim. He said, Rabbi Allah, my Rabb is Allah. What is your deen? Deen is Islam. I am a Muslim. When the angel asked the third question, Ma kunta taqul fi hazabajul. What did you used to say about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Tell him, oh angels, you can't ask any more questions. I'm a Muslim, that is sufficient. <laughs> Why are you asking me another question? Is that not enough for you? So if someone says that to you, give the answer. Don't ask, do not Say that to me, do not ask me another question. Say that to the angel in the cover. The angels in the cover, when they ask you about Rasulullah sallallahu Because once you have said, I am a Muslim, why are they asking you another question? Huh? Why are they asking you the third question? To differentiate between the real Muslims and the so-called Muslims, the true Muslims and the deviants. Because deviants will exist in the Ummah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa You know a lot of people, they say, I'm a Muslim, why do you believe in the Prophet sallallahu I believe in Muhammad bin Abdullah. Why? Because Islam orders me to believe in Muhammad, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa But people, you exaggerate in venerating the Prophet sallallahu You think that all Islam is about the Prophet sallallahu I believe in the Prophet sallallahu because Allah orders me, Islam orders me. That is the only reason why I believe in Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa I love him, I have love for him. But you guys exaggerate. You know, you say too much about the Prophet sallallahu You shouldn't exaggerate too much. I believe in him. In order for me to be a Muslim, I have to believe in him. Yes, I believe in him. And that is sufficient. But don't praise the Prophet sallallahu Don't venerate the Prophet sallallahu too much. Don't do hulu in the, in the respect of the Prophet sallallahu A common statement made by people. Yes, other people make this statement. The answer to that is simple. When the angels have asked you, what is your deen? What did you say? 
my thing is Islam. In Islam, to be a Muslim, do you have to believe in the Prophet or not? Yes, yes, yes. So when he said he is a Muslim, when he said he is a Muslim, is he not saying I believe in Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam? He's saying that, isn't he? When he said I am a Muslim, by saying I am a Muslim, I believe in Islam. I'm a Muslim. He's also saying that I believe in Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So that means he's a Muslim who believes in Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Why then the third question is asked? That is to differentiate between those who believe in the Prophet ﷺ because of Islam. They are those who say we only believe in the Prophet ﷺ, we are ordered. As if they are majboor in believing in the Prophet ﷺ, they are forced in believing in the Prophet ﷺ. And then they are those who believe in Islam because of Rasulullah ﷺ. They are those who believe in Islam because of Rasulullah ﷺ. So the angels will ask the question, first man Rabbu, who is your Lord? Rabbi Allah. Madin, what is your deen? Deen yet Islam. But the third question, it is still vague, isn't it? There is still some ambiguity. Why is that? Do you believe in Muhammad ﷺ because of Islam? Are you from those people who believe in Rasulullah ﷺ because of Islam? As if you are forced to believe in the Prophet ﷺ? Or are you from those who believe in Islam because of Rasulullah ﷺ? Ma kunta taqulu fi hadha rajul and the two ashik and the lover of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam he will say mar ke pahuncha hu ya is dil ro ke vaaste the beloved of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam I believe in Islam because of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that is why the third question is asked and the third question is all about aqeedah isn't it? ma kunta taqoolu fi hasrun what did you used to say about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam obviously when he will see the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the qabr when he will see Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the qabr he will accept he will believe in the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he used to say in dunya, the Prophet ﷺ is in Medina to Munawwara. He has no knowledge of the people in South Africa. When you call upon the Prophet ﷺ, he cannot come and help you. When you say, Ya Rasulullah, yunzur halana, Ya Habib Allah, isma qalana, innani fi dahri amni mu'rakun, khuz yadi, when you say, khuz yadi, khuz yadi, Ya Rasulullah ﷺ, help me, Ya Rasulullah ﷺ, hold my hand. How can he hold your hand from Medina to Munawwara? It is impossible for the Prophet ﷺ to come to this, to, to South Africa, it's not possible. But in the cover, he says this in dunya, doesn't he? In dunya, in his gatherings, in his talks, in his lectures, he will say, he cannot come, he cannot help you. But what will happen in the cover? What will happen in the cover? In his cover, in the graveyard, in Pretoria, graveyard here. When he's buried in the graveyard here, suddenly in the cover, he will see Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When he will see Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he will immediately believe that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam can come from Madinah to Munawwar. He will believe in that, won't he? When he will see Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa This is why the sequence of the question has changed also. First was, Man Rabbuk, Ma Deenu, Who is your Lord? What is your Deen? Now, the question is not, Who is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Even though there are some hadith in which that question is also mentioned. But I'm specifically talking about this hadith of Sayyid Bukhari. Because people claim Sayyid Bukhari. What is the question? What did you used to say about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Meaning, not now, not now, because now he will accept that he can come to the cover. Now his aqidah has changed. Now he will accept. Yes, he can come from Madinah al Munawwara to the graveyard in South Africa. He can come. Now the question has changed. Now the question is not what do you say about him now? No. In your masajid, in your Juma khutbah, what did you used to say about him then? Not now. Now your aqidah will change. But the hukum will be given based on what you used to say in the khutbahs in your masajid. Huh? So this third question is all about the aqidah of our sunnah. Huh? So this division will take place. This division will take place in the Ummah and this is directly based on the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Undoubtedly, we are Muslims and we are also Ahlus Sunnati wal Jama'ah That's important for us to know Now, how do we know who are Ahlus Sunnati wal Jama'ah? Huh? You know, Imam Zayn al-Abidin rahimahullah was once, once questioned that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that the Ummah will divide When the Ummah will divide, who will be the ones who are on the right path? Imam Zayn al-Abidin rahimahullah said, it is the Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'ah. <laughs> the questioner then asked the question. The questioner has done a great favor upon us. He's done a great favor upon us. He said, 
But what if many people start claiming to be Ahlu Sunnati Wal Jama'ah? Huh? What if everyone starts claiming to be Ahlu Sunnati Wal Jama'ah? How do we differentiate between Ahlul Haq and Ahlul Bid'ah? Ahlul Sunnah and Ahlul Bid'ah? Imam Zayn al Abidin Rahimahullah has done a great favor upon the Ummah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said, the distinguishing factor, the isolating mark, the Haddul Imtiyaz, Haddul Fasil between Ahlul Bid'ah and Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah is Salat and Salam upon Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Ahlul Sunnah will always send the root upon Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is what happens after every Jum'ah. Mustafa jane rahmat pe laakum salam. Chame wazme hilayat pe laakum salam. And this is how we recognize. These are the people who send salutations upon the beloved of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Continuously they send the root upon Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Undoubtedly these are the real Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. Now, but then, you know, then you find some other people. Some some pseudo Sufis also, <laughs> some fake Sufis, pseudo Sufis. They will give themselves names of. Man, that's fine. Funny is another name. The baat ho, to ishki pyaas pani the name will be. The other that comes from Allah, so I think So how do we know the Ahlul Haq and Ahlul Bida? Remember, about la riba fi. Why did I why did I mention la riba fi? There's no doubt in it, huh? Why did I mention that? Allah says there is no doubt in the Quran. But why is it that many Muslims recite the Quran and they have ikhtilaf? They have conflict. Muslims debate with Muslims. And they all present verses of the Quran. And this is why I presented verses of the Quran from both. Because everyone presents Quran. The Qadriya presented Quran. The Jabriya presented Quran. The Mu'tazila presented Quran. Quran Ahmed Qadiani, he proves himself to be a prophet from the Quran. Allah. Huh? They think Ariyaz of Billah, which is not true. The Quran, Surah Baqarah, the same Quran says, You think that he can hear him, he can hear him. Many people are misguided by reciting the Quran, and many people are guided. So, Quran is not sufficient for guidance. Quran is necessary for guidance. Quran is necessary. In order for you to attain guidance, Quran is necessary. But it's not sufficient. It's not enough. We need something else. We need the hadith of the Prophet. We need the explanations of the Sahaba Ali Murikun. We need the opinions of Sultan Salihi. We need the Ijma of the Ummah to understand the Quran. Otherwise, anyone will say anything. So, Quran is necessary, but it's not sufficient. Because Quran itself says many people will recite Quran and they will be guided. And many people recite Quran, they will be misguided. You know, for the literalists, they take the verses of the Quran literally. On, on their manhaj and their basis, if they ask you too many questions, how do you know that who has been guided by reciting the Quran and how do you know who has been misguided? Because they take literal meanings of the verses of the Quran, this is an answer only for them. Only for them. Yes, this is not the answer of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. This is Ilzami Jawab just for them. What is the Jawab? How would you know who are the people who are guided by reciting the Quran and who are the people who are misguided by reciting the Quran? Read Surah Kahf. Allah Jalla Wala says, "Man yahdi Allahu, fahuwa al-muhdadi, wa man yudli, wa man yudli." Many people are guided by reciting the Quran. We want to know who gains guidance by reciting the Quran and who is misguided by reciting the Quran. Allah says, "Man yahdi Allahu, fahuwa al-muhdadi." وَمَنْ يُدْلِلْ فَلَنْ تَجِدَ لَهُ وَلِيًّا مُرْشِدًا وَلِيًّا مُرْشِدًا This is for the literalists. Only for the literalists. They say, Wali, Peer, Shaykh, Murshid, this word, where does it come from? Open the Quran, prove it from the Quran. We will say, Allah says, who are guided and who are misguided? The people who are misguided are those who will never have a Wali with them and never have a Murshid with them. Meaning, the full Muhammad of that is, that who are guided by reciting the Quran, see if they are affiliated to a wali or a murshid. If he has a wali or a murshid, then he is guided by the Quran. <laughs> so, as I said, that's for the literalists only. I'm coming back to La Reiba Fihi Kudal Al Murtaqeen. La Reiba, there is no doubt in it. So why is it that people have shock about the Quran? When the Quran says there is no doubt in it, but people have different opinions, different aqaid, and they will recite the Quran. The answer to that is 
Read the full Quranic verse. La reiba. There is no doubt in this. Now this is for the tulab al For the ulama. La reiba. If you do tarkib of this. La reiba fi. What's the tarkib? La is harf nafidins. Reiba is the ism. Yes? Then we have fi jar majroor. Which is mutallik to the mutalla. What is that? Thabitun. Which is the khabra la. Harf of jins. Yes? It's a khabra, isn't it? La. Reiba. Thabitun. Fi. Thabitun has a huwa. The name of Muhammad al Muttasid. Which is a zulha. Which is a zulha. Yes? There is other tarkeeps also. But I'm giving this tarkeep. Zulha. So, huwa is a zulha. What's the hal? The hal is. Koi hal ne yami. Again. Yes, the hal ne yami. Koi. Inshallah, again, kuch aisi baat karunga. Ki hal a jayega. Ah. वो एक और हाल है, वो चिश्तियों का हाल होता है, कादरियों का भी होता है, सब का हाल, the hal is hudan, the hal is hudan. Now hal, there are many types of hal. You have the hal itifaqiya, you have the hal bayaniya, you have the hal taaliliya. For instance, if I say, if I say, husband came in this gathering in a state that he was wearing a white imama. Husband came to this gathering. In a state that he was wearing a white imama. That's a hal. I'm describing the state in which he came. Yes? That's hal bayaniya. Hal intifaqiya. He was wearing a white imama. Meaning, I'm not using the hal to prove his attendance. Yes? So a hal can be bayaniya, it can be talibiya. For instance, just for everyone else to understand now. If I say, so and so is such a great architect. In a state that he built this masjid. Yes? In a state that he built this masjid. That's a hal. What kind of a hal is this? I'm praising the architect. I'm saying, look at this masjid. Look at the beauty of this masjid. The beauty of this masjid proves that he is a great architect. Do you understand? If I say, Mulana Musa Rida is a great scholar in a state that so and so is his student. Meaning, look at the greatness of his student. His student being a great scholar of Islam itself proves what a great scholar is he. What is that? Hal Taliliya. Now let's come back to the Quran. Allah says, La Reiba Fihi. La Reiba Fihi. There is no doubt in the Quran. In a state that it guides Muttaqeen. Imam Nasafi says Muttaqeen Awliya. So why does he say Muttaqeen Awliya? I'll tell you that. Why does Imam Nasafi say that Muttaqeen are awliya Allah? Why doesn't he say they're ulama? Why? There's a debate even under the Ya Yuhan Lazeen Aman Taqullah Hukun Ma'a Sadiqin Even in that the ulama debate on this. And the Sufiyah say Sadiqin are awliya Allah. Why are they awliya Allah? Why do they say that? The reason behind that. And remember, a wali has to be an alim. He has to, I'm talking about the so-called ulama. So when I'm mentioning awliya, it is those awliya who are also ulama. Okay, so why not ulama? Why not ulama? Because the ulama say, لِأَنَّ الْعِلْمَ قَدْ يَجْدَمِيُمْ عَرْضُفْ Because sometimes a person can have ilm and he can also be a kafir. Ilm and kuf can gather in one person. One person may be a scholar and then he may also be a kafir. It's possible. They can coexist. These are not kulliyayn mutabaliyayn. Yes? These two can coexist on kambil. They can be in one person. A person can be a kafir and he can also be an alim. I know many people in Cambridge University, in Oxford University, many orientalists in UK, many of our dhrsi, nizami, ulama, after studying the sciences of sharia, they go to them and study with them. This shows that a kafir can become an alim. Yes? This attribute of kufr an ilm can be in one person. And a alim can become a kafir. It's possible. Someone may be a scholar. Ula Muhammad Qadiyani was a big scholar. He became a kafir. He became a non-Muslim. Huh? So it is possible for a person to be a alim and a kafir. And it is possible for a kafir to become a scholar. And an alim to become a kafir. They can coexist. That is possible. But there is one thing which is not possible. One cannot be a wali and then become a kafir. Yes? 
if a wali becomes a kafir, kufr will eliminate his wilaya. And if a kafir becomes a wali, wilaya will eliminate his kufr. These two cannot coexist. They cannot be in one person. This is why Allah Jalla says, "La raiba fihi mudakkin muttaqin." There is no doubt in it, in a state that it is a guidance for Awliya Allah. Meaning, if you want to know what is the meaning of Uqtul al Mushrikina, if you want to know the mean, kill all the non-Muslims. Yes, the way they misquote the verse of the Quran. If you want to know the meaning of "Kajjaqum min Allah nurun wa kitabum mubin," and if you want to understand. If you want to differentiate, people are saying the Prophet is a nur, and others are saying he's only a bashar. Others are saying he is a nur who came in the form of a bashar, and to deny the basharia of Rasulullah is kufr. We believe the Prophet is a bashar, and Rasulullah's reality is beyond our imagination. But people are confused. One says, The others are saying, Both are presenting verses of the Quran. One says, The other says, It's a shirk. Both are presenting verses of the Quran. One says, Seek wasila to gain the nearness of Allah. He's presenting verses of the Quran. The other one is saying, Seeking wasila of awliya and Rasulullah to gain the kurma of Allah. It's shirk. So what's happening here? Both are presenting verses of the Quran, and the Quran says, "La raiba fi." There is no doubt in this, and the Quran says, "Lokan min hindi ghayr Allah la walidun fi akhlaq al kasira." If the Quran was from someone other than Allah, you would have found a contradiction in the Quran. Why is there a contradiction? Who created a contradiction? In reality, there is no contradiction in the Quran at all. There is no contradiction. The contradiction is created by these so-called mullahs. It is created by the so-called mullahs, the so-called. Who are away from Awliya Allah? The Quran says, "La raiba fihi udal al muttaqin." Read the complete verse of the Quran. There is no doubt in this. What is the proof of the Quran not having doubt in it? It is that those who read the Quran, some of them will become Awliya Allah. The Quran makes people Awliya Allah. And if you want to know the distinguishing factor between Ahlul Haq and Ahlul Bid'ah. Who learned the Quran and who sought guidance from the Quran and who are the people who studied the Quran and they were misguided by the Quran? If you want to know the Ahlul Haq, then do not read the books of ulama only. If you want to know who is an Haq after reciting the Quran, do not search for local mullah. Search for Ali Nawaz Ahmadullah Taala. Search for Hossein Adam Ahmadullah Taala. Ask for the teaching of Bahaudin Nasrud Ahmadullah Taala. Be the Wali for the Wali. Forget the Habib and Sarwad Ahmadullah. Let's go. 
Mahmoudi Rabiya Mahmoud Aida Ida 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 A person came to him He had some victims, some soil in front of him And the person said, I'm a green person, I'm a poor person Nizam Pak helped me Khata Nizam Pak Rahim Aula He recited the rule upon the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam And after that he recited Surah Ikhlas twice, three times Three times, Kul Huwa Allahu Ahad Allahu Sallam He recited Surah Ikhlas And then he said the rule upon the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam He did dump on the mitti, on the mud It became gold It turned into gold The person got really happy He said, wow, amazing He's given me gold And he's also told me how to make gold Usne kaya sona بھی مل گیا اور سونا بنانے کا طریقہ بھی سکھ گیا ترکیب بھی دے ترکیب بھی مل گئی he took the gold with him he went home all night he was digging he gathered a lot of mitti together a lot of soul together all night he was reciting surah ikhlas and the rule upon rasulullah صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم all night قل هو اللہ قل هو اللہ پھونکے مارتا رہا دم کرتا رہا دم کر کر کے خود بے دم ہو گیا خود بے دم ہو گیا in the morning he goes to he approaches khadir nizam ud-din اولیاء رحمۃ اللہ علیہ وسلم حضرت حضرت you told me how to make gold huh you told me how to make gold i recited the rule upon rasulullah صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم i recited surah ikhlas ye to sona kya sunehri bhi nahi bane iska rang bhi nahi badla اس کا رنگ میں نہیں بدلا نتنگ ہاپن دا انسر اف قادر نظام الدین اولیاء محبوب اللہ علیہ وآلہ 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 ہی سید there is no doubt in this the Quran has the تاثیر of changing soil into gold the Quran can do that but in order for you to do that you need the tongue of نظام الدین اولیاء you need the اثر of نظام الدین اولیاء اللہ اللہ جنید بغدادی رحمت اللہ تعالیٰ نے was walking on water he was walking on water And the person said, Ya Jin. And he was saying, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, Ya Allah. And he was walking on water. And the person said, Ya Jin, the Baghdadi, I want to do the same. I want to do the same. I want to walk because I need to cross the river. Jin, the Baghdadi, Rahmatullah Taala, said, Okay, you want to do the same? You say, Ya Jin, Ya Jin, Ya Jin. He said, Fine. He started to recite, Ya Jin, Ya Jin, and he was walking on water. Like Jain the Baghdadi Rahmatullah Ta'ala Suddenly, what happened? Huh? Min sharri al-waswas al-khannas Al-lazhi yuwaswisu fi sudur al-nas Huh? The enemy of awliya Allah Satan came, he whispered He said, Junaid is saying, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, Ya Allah And he's walking on water Huh? And he's telling you to say, Ya Junaid, Ya Junaid, Ya Junaid Huh? If Allah can save him, why can't he save you? Why is he making you say Ya Junaid? You say Ya Allah, Ya Allah, Ya Allah. And this person, obviously, this is Kalimat al-Haq, Murid al-Batil. Kalimat is Haq, but the implication is Batil. This is Satan said it. Okay. He said, that's true. Now, if he said Allah cannot help, he would have become a kafir. This was a big test, wasn't it? If he said Allah cannot help, he would have become a kafir. But he was crossing the river by mentioning the name of Junaid al-Baghdadi Rahmatullahi Ta'ala Now the advice given by Satan That was true, there was no doubt in it Apparently the words were correct Yes? What happened? He said, Ya Allah The moment he said, Ya Allah He started to drown Now what happened? Why was he drowning? Why was he drowning? Was he drowning because he was saying Ya Allah? No, no Huh? He wasn't drowning because of that. He was drowning. Who was he obeying? Who taught him to say Ya Allah? Huh? Who told him to say Ya Allah? Huh? He wasn't because تبلیغ کے لیے بلاتے ہیں اللہ 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 دین کی تبلیغ دعوہ دین they invite us whether what they are saying is correct they only say اللہ رسول اللہ اللہ رسول اللہ صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم even if they have a wrong akidah but what they are saying is correct why is it for this what they are saying is true they give دعوہ they have درس قرآن they have درس حدیث we say this is exactly what happened this is exactly what happened this person obeyed Satan why because he was saying say Ya Allah but why was Satan making him say Ya Allah because Satan Satan had the intention of insulting Junaid al-Baghdadi Rahmatullahi Ta'ala If you listen to the one who insults Junaid al-Baghdadi Rahmatullahi Ta'ala Then even if you say Ya Allah you will drown But if you mention the name of Imam Ahmad Rizal Rahmatullahi If you listen to the teachings of Allah Hazrat Rahmatullahi Then you call upon Awliya, you call upon Allah You will be a true Muahid and you will never be a Mushrik And you will never receive the curse of Allah You will only receive the mercy of Allah and the karam of Allah Because this is the man who destroyed shit from the face of the earth This is why 
ہے علماء سے شرک تھا جب ناز کرنا احمد مختار پر نکتہ چیخے لوگ ہیں میں سید امرار پر کفر پر ایک دن مشیت کو جنانا ہی گیا میرے آقا کی محبت کا سوالا ہی گیا صورت تسکین کی نکلی دلے سیماک سے ایک کرن پھوٹی اچانک چرخ پر مہداب سے اس کرن کو اہل دل احمد رضا کہنے لگے اس کرن کو اہل دل احمد رضا کہنے لگے امت خدم رسول کا پیشوا کہنے لگے اس کرن نے راہی ایمان کو منفر کر دیا پھول تو ہے پھول خانم کو گلے تر کر دیا ہے ایمان میں قوم امت کے نگہبان زندہ بار زندہ بار ہے مفتی احمد رضا حاضر نوار جنید بغداد رحمہ اللہ صرف I told you to say یا جنید یا جنید اب ذہن میں بس بسوطہ پیدا ہوگیا اللہ کا نام لے رہا ہوں calling upon Allah and I'm planning yes and I'm mentioning the name of جنید بغداد رحمہ اللہ and I'm crossing the river he had to say to himself so he was saying یا جنید یا جنید once he crossed the river and he said to جنید بغداد رحمہ اللہ تعالی یا جنید بغداد what is this When I call upon Allah, that's what happens to me. When I say your name, and then I'm protected. Junaid al-Baghdadi rahimahullah said, You have not understood Junaid yet and you're trying to understand Allah. Allah. Because he insulted. If someone says, calling upon Allah makes you drown, no, it doesn't. But when you listen to Satan, and then you call upon Allah, he tells me the intention of insulting the Wali Allah, then you will drown. You're not a man like these awliya Allah. You cannot do what they did and you claim to be like Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How can you say that? And tell me, explain to me, how can one claim that he's like Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? In what form are you like the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Tell me, how can one ever claim that they are like Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? How are we like the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? In our outward appearance, are we like Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? In our beauty, are we like the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? In our physical form, are we like the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? In our ibadah, are we like the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? In our acts of worship, are we like the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? In our ibadah, are we like the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? In no way we can be like the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Just look at your ibadah, just look at your acts of worship. Your salah is not like the salah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Your kalima is not like the kalima of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Just look at your shahadah. How do you recite shahada? You say La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam And look at the shahada of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam What does the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say? He says La ilaha illallah Ana Rasulullah Ana Rasulullah There is none worthy of worship other than Allah And I am the messenger of Allah He says I am the messenger of Allah You say Muhammad is the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Your kalima is not like the kalima of Rasulullah Look at your salah. Your namaz. Is your namaz like Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? How many namaz are for the panas? Five salah are for the panas. And about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah jalla wa'ala says in the Quran, وَمِنَ اللَّيْهِ فَتَحَجَّدْ بِهِ نَا فِلَةَ اللَّهِ The hajjud is for the pan Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. For us, five salah are for the pan Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Six salah are for the pan. Our salah is not like the salah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Our kalima is not like the kalima of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Look at your song. Look at your rosa, your song, your fasting. Is your fasting like the fasting of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam kept the song of Visal. The song of Visal. What is the song of Visal? Continuously fasting. No iftar, no suhoor. Continuously fasting without eating anything. The companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they try imitating Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They try keeping song and Visal without iftar. Continuously remain hungry. And the sahaba became so weak that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Oh sahaba, what are you doing? Ya Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam We are imitating you And this is the hadith of Sayyid al-Bukhari And also another hadith in Sayyid al-Muslim Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said 
ayyukum misli ayyukum misli ayyukum misli lastu kahiyatikum lastu mislakum i am not like you you are not like me hadith of sahih bukhari hadith of sahih muslim you are not like me i am not like you ayyukum misli who amongst you is like me rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam himself says i am not like you you are not like me this lady shows that the fasting of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is not like our fasting the salah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is not like our salah and then the zakat of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam this is fast upon rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam to give zakat is zakat fast upon rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam no our ahkam our pillars of islam how many pillars of islam are there how many five our pillars of islam are five and rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam has pillars of pillars of islam of four so oh, zakat is not fard upon the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam do you know why zakat is not fard upon the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam the muftis will tell you the ulama will tell you when is zakat established when the zakat leaves the possession the ownership of the malik in order for it to be established it has to leave the possession and the ownership of the malik and it has to be under the ownership and possession of the qabis me If I give zakat to someone who is a masraq of zakat, to whom zakat can be given, it has to leave my ownership, and he has to do kabza. Why isn't zakat fard upon Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam? In order for zakat to be established, in order for one to give zakat, it is necessary that the zakat has to leave the ownership, the possession, the milkiyat of the malik, and whoever he is giving zakat to, he has to do kabza for it. He has to become the possessor. And what's the usul in this? Al-walad wa ma fi yadihi kana li abihi. Yes, al-walad wa ma fi yadihi kana li abihi. The son and all the wealth of the son belongs to the father. We all know that the father cannot give the cow to his son. Can a father give the cow to his son? He cannot. Why? Because the young son, whatever he has, his wealth. actually belongs to his father so when the father will give zakat to his son it will not leave the ownership of the father in order for zakat to be established he has to leave the ownership of the one who is giving zakat he has to leave so when the father gives it to his son he is actually giving it to himself yes it doesn't because the sons whatever the wealth of the son is it is in reality the wealth of the father have you understood that do you do you understand this are you ready to listen to the next point إذا نتجوا زي أبيك يقول ما سي العبد وما في يده كان لي مولاه ها the slave and all his possessions whatever he has in reality belongs to the master so this is why the master cannot give zakat to his slave if a person has a slave the master is giving the zakat the zakat will not leave his ownership why because he is actually giving it to himself the one to whom he is giving the zakat is his servant he is his slave and the possession and the wealth of the slave is in reality the wealth of the master the ulama say why is zakat not fard upon the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam the question is who will the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam give zakat to who will he give it to the entire creation of allah the whole slave of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam this is what the zakat is fard upon the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam You know that? Everyone is a slave of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. All creation of Allah, all the slaves of Allah jalla wa ala, all the slaves of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So our zakat is not like the zakat of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Our salat is not like the salat of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Our fasting is not like the fasting of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Our entire life is not like the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Our children are not like the children of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Is there a verse of Quran revealed about our children? No. وَقَدْ عَادَ آلِ لَيْتَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ لِيُذْهِبَ عَنْكُمْ رِجْسَ أَهْلِ الْبَيْتِ اللَّهُ هَذْ بُرِيْفَيْدْ وَاللَّهُ هَذْ مَنْشَنْتْ الْبُرِيْتِ أَبْطَاءُ اللَّهِ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ إِنَّ الْقُرَانَ If our children are not like the children of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, our wives are not like the wives of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. About the ummahat al-mu'minin, Allah says in the Quran, "Ya nisa al-nabi, lastun nakahad min al-nisa." O wives of my beloved, O wives of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, you are not like the common women. I say, if the wives of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam are not like common women, then how can Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam be like a common man? Allah. <laughs> How can you say that? Allah is the Beat. Allah is the Sun. How can you say that? 
can you say that? What? How are we like the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Tell me, our outward appearance, our eyes, our hands, our fingers, our feet, our hair. What is that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Look at our eyes. Look at our eyes. When I'm looking at you, I cannot see what's happening behind me. And the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said in the Sahih Hadith of Sunan al-Tirmidhi, Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Inni ara ma la taruna." I see what you do not see. Whatever you cannot see, I can see that. Look at me. I cannot see what's happening behind the wall. I cannot see from here what is happening in England. I cannot see from here what's happening in Pakistan. I cannot see from here what's happening in India. I cannot see what's happening in Madinah Al Munawwarah, in Makkah Al Mukarramah. If I am in Madinah Al Munawwarah, I cannot see what's happening in South Africa. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Inni ara ma la taruna." This is for a moon. Whatever you do not see, whatever you cannot see, I can see that. Whatever you cannot see, what? What is it that you cannot see from Medina? You cannot see South Africa. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "I can see what you cannot see." Meaning, he can see from Medina to Munawwarah what's happening in South Africa. No way. Our eyes are not like the eyes of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Are our ears like the ears of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Inni asma ma la tasmauna." I can hear what you cannot hear. I can hear what you cannot hear. Meaning, whatever we cannot hear, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam can hear it, and then. Imam Ibn Hajar al-Sakani rahimahullah in Fathul Bari he mentions on the night of Miraj when Sayyidina Jibril al-Ami opened the heart of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam opened the chest of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam Sayyidina Jibril al-Ami said fihi aynani there are two eyes in the heart of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam two eyes in the heart of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam then he said there are two ears in the heart of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam two eyes and two ears in the heart of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam you have two eyes You have two ears. He has four eyes. He has four ears. You still have the audacity to say that you are like the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. How dare you say that you are like Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم? How are we like Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم? Look at your saliva. Spit it out. People will have nothing to looking at it. Huh? Look at your saliva. Look at your saliva. Spit it out. No one would want to spit on your saliva. No one would want to spit on your saliva. And look at the blessed saliva of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Sa'd bin Mu'adh radiyallahu ta'ala anhu. He was wounded. The saliva of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was applied on the wound and he was healed immediately. He was cured immediately. This is the mark of the saliva of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Is your sweat like the sweat of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam? When you are sweating No one will come close to you. They will close their nose when they go past you. And look at the sweat of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Umm Sulaim radiyallahu taala anha. Hadith of Sayyid Muslim. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is asleep and she is gathering the sweat of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The beloved of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He opens his eyes and he says, "Ma tasnayna ya Umm Sulaim? Oh Umm Sulaim, what are you doing? What are you doing?" She was gathering the sweat of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. She said. نرجو بركته لسبيان لنا يا رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يا رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم we are gathering the barakah of your sweat for our children our children gain barakah through your sweat ya rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم said asabti what you are doing is correct the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said Why are you getting blessings from us? Barakah is only with Allah. Barakah is only with Kaaba Tullah. Barakah is not with Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. It is an act of an act of shirk to seek barakah from the sweat of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. No, no, no. The sweat of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is not like our sweat. It's the blood of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Like our blood, your blood. If your blood was on someone's cloth, on someone's clothes, it is najasa ghaliza. It is najasa ghaliza. It is a filth. If you pray your salah with your blood on your clothes. Your prayer will not be valid, and if you persist, if you keep praying like that, if you know that you are not in the state of wudu, if you know that you do not have tahara, and you keep praying, you keep praying. That's an insult of salat, isn't it? Insult of salat can make you a kafir. You can become a non-Muslim. You will end up in Jahannam. Your blood can take you to Jahannam. Your blood on your clothes. Can take you to Jahannam, but what about the blood of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam? A Sahabi sucked the blood of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The other Sahaba were observing the Sahabi. Is he going to spit it out? 
They asked it, asked him, are you going to spit it out? The Sahabi said, no, I have swallowed it. I have swallowed it. Rasulullah sallallahu said, if you want to see a man of Jannah in dunya, they look at this Sahabi who swallowed my blood because the one who has my blood in his body cannot go to Jahannam. The blood of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam takes people to Jannah and your blood takes people to Jahannam and you still have the audacity to say I am like the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam how dare you claim that you are like the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and what else in you is like Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tell me brothers give me any example are your fingers like the fingers of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam you raise your finger and we see what happens he raises his finger and the moon splits in two this is the finger of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi these are the barakat of the hands of Rasulullah Look at Sayyidina Abbas He says, Ya Rasulullah I believed in you when you were in your cradle Ya Rasulullah When you were in your mahad You used to raise your finger Wherever your finger used to go The moon used to follow it The moon used to follow it The moon used to follow it And what I mentioned before, I will mention the share now. When Ahlul are present here, then you remember the Ashar and they remind you of the Ashar. Your Aulad is not like the Aulad of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Why? Because they are in the park of their heads. Bacha, bacha, noor ka. Tu hai ne noor tera. Sab karana noor ka. Your fingers are not like the fingers of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You raise your fingers. And we see what happens when you tell your children, Oi, open the door. You tell your wife, Oi, do this. She says, get away, get away. Huh? You order your wife with your finger. She doesn't listen to you. He orders the moon and the moon obeys him. You still say he's like me and I hear from the life. And then the Prophet's hadith of Sayyid Bukhari, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, placed his hand in a container. There was a bit of water in it. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam took his hand out and water started to gush out of the fingers of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Fountain like fingers, fountain like fingers. Water started to gush out of the fingers of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Raise your hand and we will see water comes out. You can place your hand in a container. You will keep striking it, hitting it. What will come out? Your hands will be wounded. Blood will come out of it, but water will never come out of your fingers. This is the maqam of the hands of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And how can we say we are like the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? How can we say the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam is like us? In what way? Tell me how. Just give me one example. Can you think of anything? Can you think your feet are like the feet of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Can anyone say that their feet are like the feet of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? You raise your feet. You raise your feet, the gravity of the earth will pull you back. It will pull you back. If you want to fly, you have to go to the airports. You have to secure your seat in the airplane in order for you to fly. And if you try jumping up, what happens? The gravity of the earth will pull you back. Because the asal pulls you back. The reality pulls you back. And this shows the asal of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa The origin of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa You raise your feet, you will fall back in this dunya. He raises his feet, he crosses the seven heads. He meets Allah Jalla and the nearness of the beloved of Allah is beyond our imagination. The nearness of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Allah Jalla is beyond our imagination. We cannot comprehend the nearness of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He meets Allah Jalla Wala. Can you meet Allah Jalla Wala? Can we meet Allah Jalla Wala? What happens? You try flying, can you fly? Can you fly? You cannot fly. Raise your feet, you will drop back in dunya. Why? Because this zameen is your asal. This is your origin. The origin of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is not this zameen. He came from Allah. He came from Allah. He went back to Allah. Where did he come from? Where did he go? For he hai awwal. For he hai akhir. For he hai zahir. For he hai baadir. For he ke jalwe. For he se milne. For he se us ki taraf gaye. نہ حلیمہ بید کھلا ہے یہ نہ مقام جنو چرا ہے یہ تو خدا سے پوچھ وہ کون تھا تیری بکریاں جو چرا گیا تیری بکریاں جو چرا گیا تو خدا سے پوچھ وہ کون تھا تیری بکریاں جو چرا گیا how can you say and then and then your existence is your existence like the existence of Rasulullah صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم if you exist 
or you don't exist. Allah. You exist or you don't exist. Does it make any difference to anyone? No. Does it make any difference to anyone? Our existence, your existence, my existence, does that make any difference to anyone? No. If I exist, I don't exist. Nothing happens. But his existence, Lola Kalama Kalatunia, Lola Kalama Kalatunia, Lola Kalama Kalatunia. Oh, beloved, if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't have created the universe. If it wasn't for you, I wouldn't have created the heavens and the earth. The entire universe is created for the sake of Rasulullah. If you didn't exist, nothing would have happened. If he didn't exist, nothing would have existed. Nothing would have existed. So I have the right to say, if your existence is not like the existence of Rasulullah then how can you be like Rasulullah The impact your existence has upon the creation is not the same as the impact of the existence of Rasulullah upon the creation. If he didn't exist, nothing would have existed. This dunya would not have existed. These stars would not have existed. These beautiful galaxies would not have existed. These gatherings would not have existed. These Mahatma would not have existed. Your organization would not have existed. These Ulama would not have existed. South Africa would not have existed. UK, Europe, no countries. Nothing would have existed. Why? Allah says, Everything came into existence for the sake of this is why Iqbal said something as well. Alama Iqbal is a great scholar. We respect him. We venerate him. A great mufakir. A great alim. But he can Ahmad Riza Ahmadullahi Ta'ala Even though Iqbal says, Hona ye bhul to bhul bhul katara nung bina ho. Chamane dahar me kar yun katabas tum bina ho. Ye na saati ho to phir mein bina ho. Hum bina ho. Bas me tawheed bhi. Dunia bina ho. Tum bina ho. There is the maqam of Iqbal. He was a ashik rasul. He was a lover of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But the maqam of Imam Ahmad Riza Rahimahullah. In the field of Nath, Imam Ahmad Reza, I always say this, I've studied the shairi of Mir Taki I have studied the shairi of Ali. I have studied the shairi of Ali. I have studied the shairi of Zouk. But the Zouk in the Kalam of Imam Ahmad Reza, there is no comparison. He says, Yes, Allah, Salak, Wo Kali, Chatak, Ye Zouba, Chahe, Kalab, Jo Jalak, Ye Mahak Jalak, Ye Chamak Damak, Sab Usi Kadam Ki Bahar Hai, Ye Saman, Ye Sao Sano, Ya Saman, Ye Banaf Chasum, Bulo Nas Taran, Bulo Sar Vidala, Bhara Chaman, Wo Ye Ek Jalwa Hadar Hai, Wo Na Tha To Baag Me Kuch Na Tha, Wo Na Tha To Baag Me Kuch Na Tha, Wo Na Ho, Wo Baag Ho, Sab Fana, Then I will conclude by saying, Baadab Jukalo, this is the Muhammad of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If it wasn't for him, nothing would have existed. Can anyone delude you? Can anyone confuse you in the future? He's like us. Huh? Listen to my lecture on this subject. I have delivered a detailed lecture on this subject about and the true meaning of this and how they delude our people. Let alone the creation, the common people, even the prophets of Allah are not like Rasulullah. Do you know the Muhri Nabuwat? The Muhri Nabuwat of all of the prophets, it was on their hands. It was on their hands. Muhri Nabuwat of Sayyidina Isa was on his hand. Musa was on his hand. All of the prophets of Allah on their hands. Why? When they communicate with, they will see it on their hands and they will recognize that this is a prophet of Allah. The question is, why? Why was the Muhr of Nabuwa wasn't on the hand of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa He was on the back of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Why? People of Ishq, they say, Oh beloved, your face is so beautiful. The one who will look at the beauty of your face will immediately understand that he is a prophet of Allah. They do not have to look at the Muhr of Nabuwa of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's the beauty of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's only the Quranic verse that I talked about. There was a lot more to discuss. I was about to, I was supposed to discuss 
the objections of the Orientalists, the, the kind of difficulties that we have when we invite non-Muslims towards Islam because of the belief of the deviants. I was supposed to go to, through the Sanat of the Awliya and the chain of Awliya and I was supposed to go through all the Ahadith to prove that we, the believers of Ya Rasulullah and the believers of Awliya Allah are the true Ahl Sunnati Wal Jama'ah and how important it is for us if we want to remove the stigma of terrorism from the Islam and the way Islam is being presented today in the international media the only way of doing that is by affiliating ourselves to the path of Sufiya and up to the path of Awliya Allah if we want Islam to spread all over the world and if we want to invite non-Muslims towards Islam the only way possible is the teachings of Awliya Allah I'm a student of the Kabul Adhyan of comparative religion the only problem that I have when I discuss with non-Muslims are the teachings and the education, the entire educational matrix of the deviants, they pick on those things. Till today, they could not criticize a single teaching of the Sufiya. They, this is why it's important we promote the teaching of the Uliya. Since we talked about the significance and the greatness of Uliya Allah, let me give you a vid today. This is one of the specialties of our gatherings. After every gathering, we give a vid. Today's tofa, a gift today, is a very important one. It's a very special gift. This is a gift. If you act upon this, inshallah, according to Sayyiduna Ma'roof Karhi Rahmatullahi Ta'ala, if one reads this ten times daily, according to one narration, according to another narration, if one recites it thrice, three times every day, that person's name will be written with the names of Abdals. Abdal. I know people, I have given this bill to people. They say to me, Peer Sahib, we have written in our diaries and in our notebooks that we will read this. We've set alarm clocks to remind us to read this every day. But if something happens and we can't remember, we forget this bill. So only fortunate people, huh? those people who are blessed people, will remember this. And this is the test of all of us. That will you be able to remember this or not? This is not a little bit. It's an amazing bit. If you listen to my lectures about Saleh, Najib, Naqib, Qutb, Qutb, Abdal, Utah, the ghost, the different maqamat. Abdal is not a little maqam. Abdal is a very great maqam in the path of spirituality. And just imagine you being raised with Abdal in the hereafter. Huh? With Abdal in the hereafter. So this is a bit. If you take note, inshallah, write it down or record it or take it from the brothers later. There are only three lines. Sayyidina Maruf Karhi Rahmatullah Ta'ala says there are two chains of transmission for this. According to one narration, if you read three times daily, your name will be written with Abdals. According to another narration, if you read it ten times daily, your name will be written with the names of Abdals and you will be raised with the Abdals in the head after. But it's best to read it ten times. It's not difficult. Inshallah, if you remember it, then reading it three times. If you remember it for reading it three times, then you will read it ten times well, inshallah. Allahumma aslih ummata Muhammad If you recite this after me Allahumma aslih ummata Muhammad Allahumma arham ummata Muhammad Allahumma farrij an ummati Muhammad These three lines I recite it once again. Allahumma aslih ummata Muhammad. Allahumma arham ummata Muhammad. Allahumma farrij an ummati Muhammad. These three lines, once again. Allahumma aslih ummata Muhammad. Allahumma arham. Ummata Muhammad Allahumma farrij An ummati Muhammad Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Recite this ten times every day inshallah And Allah accept this Another word If you recite in a public place, market place, a shopping center We all go to shopping centers don't we? According to the Sahih Hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam If you recite the fourth kalima Huh? Do you know the fourth kalima? What is it? Can somebody read it? La ilaha illallah 
وحده لا شريك له له الملك والحمد لله تعالى فوق كل ما if you decide that once once in a shopping center in a market we go there every day once you read it the beloved of Allah Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said one million good deeds are written in your account one million sins are forgiven and one million darajat are increased ranks are increased fourth kalima we all know it if you don't know it memorize it whenever you go to bazaar to market places to shopping centers just read it once one million good deeds are written one million sins are forgiven and one million darajat are elevated increased if you read the fourth kalima that's the second tawfa the third tawfa ye bazurgon ke liye agar aapki aulad na farman ho gayi hai if your children have become rebellious if they have distanced themselves from you i have delivered a detailed lecture based on 20 points of how to raise your children according to the quran sunnah and human psychology and the teachings of the psychologists who study the psychology of children and it is based on the quran and the sunnah of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam 20 points are given and that's very beneficial for all parents if your children have become rebellious if they have distanced themselves from you how to raise your children how to bring them back inshallah Allah, if you listen to that lecture that's available on youtube and it was aired on yaq tv and inshallah watch that and also a bird a special bird for the parents who believe that their children they do not listen to them after salat al fajr or after the time of fajr has entered after suq al sadiq till tulu uh, al shams till the sunrise from the beginning of fajr till sunrise your children if they are asleep try your best to place your right hand on their forehead and look in the sky and recite ya shahid 21 times according to one narration there are two narrations on this 21 times ya shahid look up in the direction of the sky and you can look at the roof as long as it's in that direction so you recite ya shahid 21 times and you recite the rood upon the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam before it and after it inshallah continuously with the recitation of this your children will become obedient inshallah the fourth wealth is if you have fear of your enemies attacking you during those days people were saying there's a lot of crime in south africa there are a lot of enemies there's a lot of adawa and so inshallah this will be a useful wealth so if you have a fear that some enemy is about to attack you during those days after salat al fajr recite surah quraish li ila fi quraish 111 times surah quraish how many times 111 times and recite the rood before and after it inshallah your household will be protected from the enemies and allah jalla wala will be protected bless you with tahaffuz and protection inshallah and act upon this and keep reading this and the greatest enemy there is no doubt is satan himself allah protect us from the attacks attacks of satan inshallah in this gathering we started with the practical methods of toba let us test our memories what is toba what is the acronym of toba pran good mashallah so if ever we commit a sin we don't intend to commit a sin the condition is never intend it's a mockery of allah's rahma if you make an intention of sinning and then you do toba at the time of toba we have to persuade ourselves that we will never sin again with the help of allah jalla wala So what does P stand for? To repent from the sins committed in the past. Excellent, mashallah. What does R stand for? Remorse. Remorse. What does A stand for? Remorse. For sake of Allah. What does N stand for? Remorse. Mashallah, mashallah. Allah accept all your efforts. People who have come from other distant places, those who have sent the emails, um, I could not, unfortunately, discuss the issue of Maulid. even though i promise i even sent an email back and to that family they said they've got their wife and they've been listening to a certain mufti's talks and his wife has left the path of the sunnah and the brother said that his children have come here today and, uh, and they they want to listen to the talk on maulidul nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the children promised that if maulid can be proven we will accept the dalai of maulid unfortunately uh, we have alhamdulillah with the karam of allah covered a lot of subjects I request that brother to stay here tonight in Shalwa and to attend the gathering tomorrow. There is a question answer session tomorrow. In that, I will be giving priority to the subject of Maulid in Shalwa, 
and I will give you the light, such the light of Mawlid that no deviant, inshallah, will ever be successful in deviating you and taking you away from the path of Allah Sunnah. Inshallah, you will be so confident in the subject of Mawlid itself, you won't have to even discuss the issue of Bid'ah, you will prove the Mawlid and Mawlid being the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. But I do apologize that I couldn't discuss that subject. Other people have sent uh, emails and people have uh, met me, those who have come to join our tariqah, to give bayah in our tariqah, the request and inshallah I will meet you after this, but inshallah for other awrad and mazayf, I will be present here inshallah tomorrow and I will be answering your questions, I will be meeting you and those who have uh, given bayah in our tariqah and the shadras, others things have not been given, been given to them, inshallah the brothers from UK will send them to you. Any other questions that you have, our organization brothers, Habibi uh, Ridwan is present here, you can contact Habibi Ridwan, but the Habib Jami should be here. If you can send up his order, brother, he will give you our booklets and all the information about our manhaj, our da'wah work, our work with non-Muslims, how we invite non-Muslims to Islam, and what are the practical methods of giving da'wah to non-Muslims, and how to answer their objections. We have prepared some literature, inshallah you can take that from brother Habib Jami. And if you have any other questions, inshallah we'll be answering them. Jazakumullah khaira, wa ahsan al jazak, wa akhiru da'wana. Okay, the questions will be answered tomorrow. And tomorrow when you come, you write the questions and, and send them to us and we will answer the questions. Also, if you want to contact us directly, then Kamsul Huda is the name of our website. K-A-N-Z-U-L-H-U-D-A.com. Kamsul Huda.com.